Welcome everyone to our third installment of Legends of the Halls. I'm Diane Elster Devine, Development Officer with the Leadership Circles of Giving program here at the Museum of Natural History, and we're so pleased you could join us. Our Legends of the Hall series focuses on some interesting past events and people of the museum and the impact they had in shaping who we are today. During this evening's presentation, please feel free to ask any questions you may have. Uh, throughout the presentation on the chat or question and answer tabs you'll see on your screen. And we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end of the presentation. So far during our Legends series, we've taken a look at our first Sea Center. We've journeyed into the life of our museum's first anthropologist, David Banks Rogers. And tonight you'll learn about Peggy Maximus, the remarkable woman who con conceived of and founded our Maximus Gallery with our Legends of the Halls, appropriately named For Love of Nature, A Gift of Art. Our presenter tonight is another remarkable woman, Linda Miller, our curator of the John and Peggy Maximus Gallery. Linda attended Cal State Long Beach for a degree in social work, but found herself more drawn to the field of art history. It was while living in England that she became aware of the antiquarian book and print world. Returning to Santa Barbara, she established a retail store in the old El Paseo, where she specialized in European botanical prints. It was there she first met Peggy Maximus. She was asked to put her expertise to work on a cataloging, excuse me, cataloging project for the museum's print collection in 1998 and became the gallery curator in 2001. During her nearly 20 years at the museum, she has written and published catalogs on early scientific illustrators and planned and curated numerous exhibits in the Maximus Gallery. She has traveled to see original manuscripts and do research at the Museum of Natural History in London, the libraries of, Linnaeus, of the Linnaeus Society, the Royal Society, and print room at Windsor Castle. Linda maintains a network of colleagues and specialists in the print world throughout the United States and has added major works to the museum's art collection. It is my pleasure to introduce Linda Miller with For Love of Nature, A Gift of Art. Welcome, and thank you for joining me this afternoon. During this talk, I'll be sharing some personal recollections on the life of Peggy Maximus, as well as her involvement and the contributions to the Museum of Natural History. It's fair to say that the gallery owes its existence to the, to the vision, dedication, and the generosity of this remarkable woman. So Peggy was born in Poltava, Ukraine, before the First World War, and she came to America when she was four years old with her parents, a brother, and sister. Um, the family settled in Hollywood. Here is a photo given to me by a childhood friend. The Peg, um, Peggy is the tall girl with the impish smile in the back row. She was always fairly private about her early life, and being a woman of discretion, even a little secretive, I would say, about her age, a little sleuthing on Ancestry.com led me to finding the fact that she attended uh, Hollywood High School, and here is her picture from her graduation. She took drama classes at USC. A woman of strong ideas and opinions. In the years that followed, <clears throat> Peggy established herself as one of Los Angeles leading interior designers. She advocated for decorating in a modern style from her post as design consultant at Modern Home, which was a luxury department store in, the, in Beverly Hills. And I've included here a few slides of her work. Uh, we have her whole collection of these photos in our archives at the museum. They always remind me of film sets from the black and white movies of the 1940s and 50s. She used a lot of black lacquer and animal prints and oriental touches. Her work was featured in national magazines, including Architectural Digest, and this is Peggy's own copy of one of those issues that we have 
in our, our archives. This beautiful photo from 1945 was taken by her friend, Julia Schulman, who was a legendary photographer of mid-century California architecture with whom she maintained a lifelong friendship. Peggy was in her late 30s when she met John Maximus, who was a commercial illustrator from New York City. His accounts included major corporations such as Coca-Cola and Hunt Foods and McGraw-Hill Publishing. He had an office in Rockefeller Center, and here this is where you see him now looking very dashing. And he came out to California um, to do some work on the West Coast where he met and fell in love with the vivacious auburn haired designer and they were married in 1948. Peggy was 37. So she moved to New York and worked with him in his design firm, taking a different last name so that people wouldn't know they were married. She told me she called herself Peggy O'Neill. It was the 1950s after all. And together they began to collect a reference library of prints. They knew that most of these illustrations are housed in museums and libraries and private collections and are rarely shown to the public. So they began to search for examples for use as inspiration for John's design work. They went to antiquarian bookshops and auctions and poked around antique shops on their travels. Peggy told me that during these years, they loved to sail on freighters. And this is the pair of them on one of their trips in their funny hats. Here is another picture of Peggy that I debated upon about showing um, a little old Hollywood cheesecake with her short grass skirt and her high heels. But um, I thought it showed her personality and her sense of fun. And here they are um, many years later outside their apartment in New York City on the Upper East Side. After 20 years in New York, Peggy was tired of the city and she missed California. So they retired to Santa Barbara in 1977 where they lived in the Mission Cam Canyon neighborhood and they began to visit the museum and think of it as a place that might be interested in sharing their natural history art collection with the community. Peggy loved the architecture and the natural setting. This is a photo of the front of the museum at the time from Peggy's scrapbook. John's death in the early 1980s was a terrible blow and Peggy said it took a couple of years for her to wake up and shake herself out of her lethargy and begin to think about the project that the two of them had envisioned. She became more involved with the museum and joined the newly formed advisory council. In 1985, Peggy's vision began to take form. She presented museum director Dennis Power with whom she shared an understanding and a mutuality, as she put it, a financial gift and a plan that she might be allowed to convert an unused space as a place to show their antique prints. This began the transformation of a 10 by 30 foot storage closet located in the present bird hall space into a small elegant gallery by this time named in memory of her husband, John. Peggy worked closely with the museum exhibit team to design the displays. Here she is during the construction of that little gallery, bent down, I think she's taking a photograph of one of the exhibit staff there. She selected the art, she wrote text copy, she planned the design, and in the early years, she even made the cheese plates for the preview receptions. Here's a photo of one of the exhibits in the finished space. 
and Peggy and Dennis at the opening reception. After 10 years, the success of this small gallery led to plans to build a new larger Maximus wing onto the southeast corner of the existing museum. By this time, Dennis had moved on to a post at the Oakland Museum, but Peggy was committed to forging ahead with the project they talked about. The local architect, John Pitlin, was hired to draw the plans and construction began in the fall of 1994. Here's a picture of Peggy as she broke ground. Characteristically, she didn't want any fanfare or publicity. And on this auspicious day, only she and the groundskeeper were there to commemorate the moment. And here are a few pictures from that time of the construction, a huge project, obviously building this addition to the back of the museum. And here is the finished building. In May 1995, the present Maximus wing was dedicated. The inaugural exhibit was opening was held later that spring. Here's a picture of that occasion of a clearly delighted Peggy and Dennis Power who had come back to town to escort Peggy into the room. The large addition to the museum added an intimate gallery, a spacious office for a full-time curator and exhibit designer. These are contemporary photos of the spaces, and a climate-controlled storage room in which to safely store the growing print collection. These pictures don't really give you a sense of the, uh, the size of the room, which is considerable. Over the years, Peggy donated their remarkable con collection containing over 2,000 antique natural history prints to the museum. I should say a word about the nature of this collection because it does have a very specialized focus. Many of these works were made during a time when there was an influx of prints of plants and animals new to um, European naturalists during the age of discovery. And as the sciences developed, Illustrating species became an essential element of this process. Detailed images were published in significant numbers so that information could be shared. Originally done for scientific identification, as printing methods improved and more skilled artists were involved, they became sought after for their intrinsic beauty. Among the most prominent holdings are works by John James Audubon, the great 19th century painters, painter of birds and animals, and Peggy's favorite artist. And this is his copy of um, The Swift Fox. These are all prints that Peggy gave to the museum. The museum is one of the few places in the world to have a gallery dedicated to showing this combination of history, science, nature, and art. The collection represents a sampling of American and European artists and illustrators from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Here are a few of Peggy's favorites, and these are all from her collection. I could have picked any number of them. First, a lemur from the 18th century French artist Jean-Baptiste Audubert. We have over 40 plates from this wonderful work on monkeys and lemurs in the collection. The common flying squirrel is from Audubon's North American Quadrupeds from 1845. Here is a bullfrog 
from Englishman Mark Catesby's famous natural history of the flora and fauna of colonial America. A Charming Little Duck by Johann Frisch from a survey of German birds. Here's Alexander Wilson's Louisiana Tanager from his American Ornithology, published in eight volumes in 1808. Italian Shells by Niccolo Gualtieri from 1700. We have nearly 300 plates from this beautifully colored 18th century German book on shells by Friedrich Martini and a large portion of Basil Bessler's engravings of an early German Baroque garden printed in 1613. Very rare prints and we have nearly 300 of those from Peggy. This year <clears throat> celebrates the gallery's 25th year. During that time, we have created original exhibits showcasing these fascinating prints and putting them into historical context in three exhibits a year, organized around themes, including the history of science, biology, and the discovery of the world. Here are a few slides of recent gallery shows. This one was a couple of years ago. It was called The Kingdom of California, and it featured original antique maps showing uh, California for the period of time that it was um, mistakenly considered to be uh, an island adrift in the Pacific Ocean. This is from Wild Things, which is uh, an exhibit about the lithographs of mammals by John James Audubon. And this one was called Strange Silence, Science, all really early quirky prints from um, the Curiosity of Cabinets by uh, Alberta Siba, early um, 18th century Dutch prints. And these are all in our collection now. And here's a, a specimens and a drawing table. We often add a drawing component in the gallery so that um, young people and actually whole families can come in and be surrounded by the masters of early scientific illustration and try their hand at drawing. We had a match the mammal game in there where kids had to match up the squares. It was very popular among adults as well as kids. This is from a, an exhibit a few years ago on the origins of the museum as a museum of contemporary oology and about the life of William Leon Dawson and his Birds of California. That's pretty self-explanatory what that exhibit is about. We did a beautiful uh, show a few years ago on the photographiers by Edward Curtis, uh, turn of the century uh, photographer of Native American life. And these are all belong to our rare books library portfolios. Insecta featured a, a, a display of antique, early antique um, microscopes that were on loan, really fascinating, along with a lot of uh, entomology prints. These are by Maria Sibylla Marion from her wonderful work on um, from Suriname. And um, Deep, which featured um, ocean exploration. So it's ornithology, plants, botany, zoology, entomology, and anthropology. Here is John Gould, prolific publisher of bird illustrations in the 19th century. And part of a trio of exhibits we did on um, Audubon's work 
starting with songbirds in the spring, the grebe is from the water birds, and we did um, ended with the birds of prey. Again, here's Alexander Wilson, the father of American ornithology. This one was exotic botany, where we compared Western science with origins of Eastern art. And for Slither, we had recently received a donation of over 60 early engravings from Mark Catesby's um, Natural History of Colonial, Colonial America, and there were uh, mainly snake engravings, but they're so beautifully done that we decided to uh, do a show called Slither, and we talked about uh, uh, mythology and biology, and we borrowed a lot of, I had a lot of specimens from our zoology department. We love to borrow objects from our other departments to, to fill out the, the one-dimensional artwork on the walls. Beauty and Science is about orchids. We've done several shows on orchids. This is Empire Elegance, um, the Age of Redoute and the refinement of early printing in France. And that's from Strange Science, I mentioned a little bit before. And Beneath a Wild Sky is what still is hanging in the gallery. We hope we'll be able to open it sometime soon so that you can all come and have a look. It's a beautiful exhibit showing original uh, engravings and lithographs of birds that are now extinct. I was fortunate to know Peggy quite well during her last years. We first met in my shop in the old El Paseo downtown, where I specialized in selling antique botanical prints. I think we became friends because we bonded over a mutual love of this rather unusual niche in the art world. Everyone knows what a watercolor is or an oil painting, but an engraving or a lithograph printed on paper and a um, hundred years ago is a little bit dif more difficult to, to understand, I guess. It may seem an esoteric subject, but there's so much information and scholarship available, especially now with the internet and the digitization of original text that there is really nothing in our collection that isn't um, identified. Eventually, Peggy brought me to the museum to be curator of her collection, and that was nearly 20 years ago. Over that time, I've curated over 50 exhibits in the gallery, and the collection has grown to twice its original size, thanks to donations and a legacy from Peggy that includes a dedicated acquisition and a conservation fund. Her primary interest was always to introduce children to these beautiful depictions of nature and to encourage them to be willing to work to take care of the plants and animals in our world. Those were direct quotes from her. Here is a lovely picture of Peggy with uh, former museum director Carl Hutterer, with whom she had a warm relationship and a meeting of the minds. For those of us who knew her, her tenacity in seeing her goal realized through changes in administrations over 20 years was a remarkable accomplishment. Peggy passed away in June 2004. That summer, a beautiful celebration of her life was held outdoors by the creek at the museum, attended by her family, community leaders, admirers, and old friends, including Julia Schulman, who had photographed Peggy's work 50 years earlier. A string quartet from the Music Academy Young Artists Ensemble played A Souvenir of Florence by her favorite composer Tchaikovsky, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. A Russian proverb was printed in the program which described Peggy's philosophy. Teshe yedesh dalshe budish. With patience, all things are possible. Peggy was a woman of the world, curious about everything, and determined to give this 
gift of art of natural history to her community of Santa Barbara. In her own words, while photographs capture the exactitude of a subject, it is only the brush in the hand of a sensitive, talented, nature-loving artist that can capture the beauty of form, the color, the texture, and personality of the subject. Peggy never had children of her own, but she regarded her patronage of local institutions as her own children. She provided ongoing support, uh, not only for the Maximus Gallery at the Museum of Natural History, but for the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the Music Academy of the West, the Public Library, and a scholarship program for foster youth. To sum up, Peggy Maximus is remembered by those of us who knew her for her sense of style, her love of the natural world, and the perseverance of her vision. Thanks to her generosity, the collection will continue to grow and to develop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. We so appreciate you sharing with us really some personal views in connection with Peggy and others and the importance of the, the Maximus Gallery in our collections. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Um, you had mentioned that John and Peggy retired to Santa Barbara. Had they visited the Santa Barbara area in, in earlier days? Do you know? You know, I don't, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I know that she wanted to bring to John to Santa Barbara when they moved back to New York. Uh, I think she just thought it was a beautiful area to live and rather than to return to Los Angeles, um, I don't really know how she, how she came to, to land in Santa Barbara. Um, someone else wants to know, what was the first exhibit shown at the Maximus Gallery? It was called Drawn from Nature. It was a few highlights from her print collection. It wasn't as focused as some of the subjects we've taken on in recent years. Did John and Peggy have a, um, they curated their prints, kept them at home and took care of them themselves or were they stored elsewhere? I'm sorry. I was just wondering if John and Peggy kept their collection at their home and curated them themselves or were they stored oh. elsewhere? Well, once they moved here, uh, she lived in a condominium very near here, and I was there many times, as was Dennis Power and Carl. Um, very modest place. She had a few uh, of her prints on the wall. She also collected a lot of uh, Chinese and Asian art. Um, I think she kept a lot of things in a portfolio in her closets and under her bed, honestly. She didn't really have a fully formed uh, vault like we do now to to um, store the prints. And I think um, her childhood friend Emma told me that she was really surprised when they moved back here to learn the the scope of their collection, how, how large it was. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, someone wanted to know if, if Peggy had a favorite Maximus show herself, if you were aware of that. A favorite show? She had a favorite show in the Maximus Gallery. Well, uh, it would have been something that um, featured the works of John James Audubon because that was her first love. Um, it was in, um, in my first few years here, I would often pick her up and bring her over to the preview. And I know that she loved seeing people in the gallery enjoying the shows. In the years since Peggy's gone, I've diverged a little bit by um, painting the walls some daring colors. She set some, she want, in the first years it was all set to be a kind of a pale gray green color. She thought it was neutral. I think she was worried that people would go crazy. But these days we do deep blue, deep gray, citron. I've gone through the color palette, but I think of her and I feel as if as a designer, she would understand that as long as it was in good taste and complimented the work on the art on the wall that she would be pleased. Well, I should mention too to our guests that one of the benefits of membership in leadership circles is that we have the opportunity to go behind the scenes. And we have done that a couple times at the Maximus collection. And really it's amazing to see it in person. Yeah. The, the 
vibrant colors. And so we always appreciate that opportunity. Um, there was one last question, and that is what gallery exhibits are you planning for 2021? Well, 2021 is a little <laughs> uncertain for us right now. Um, we, I think we're going to hold on to Beneath a Wild Sky, which is, uh, I mentioned, is a beautiful exhibit up in the gallery now for when the interior galleries are able to open. Um, I'm working on one from early spring called A Medicine to the Mind. It's about early gardening catalogs. I thought at this point we might, might need a cheerfulness on the earth and a story of what spring and um, a beautiful garden can bring to the to to uh, people's mood. We may we may need it by then. Um, we'll go ahead with hummingbirds, which we postponed for this June, and then we've been working on a, a show called What's in Our Drawers, which is uh, a lot of specimens from different curators. Um, that want to showcase what's in their drawers in the various collection rooms, we may postpone that a while. So we're, we're still kind of shuffling our exhibit schedule, but we'll always have something interesting for people to come to see. Love the name, what's in our drawers. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we close out this week's Legends of the Halls, I'd like to thank Linda once again for sharing her knowledge and personal connection with Peggy Maximus and for all the amazing exhibits that have been presented in the John and Peggy Maximus Gallery during these past 25 years. <laughs> we hope you'll come visit the gallery once our interior spaces are open back up. And if you'd like to contact Linda with additional questions or comments, please feel free to email her at lmiller at sbnature2.org. And don't miss our next final Legends of the Halls in our August series titled Landscapes, Preserving Nature with Diorama, on Saturday, August 29th at 5 p.m. This examination looks at the museum's relationship with the Santa Barbara art community, which began in the early 1920s. Learn which Western art icons left their brushstrokes on our walls and hear the stories behind the museum's diorama art and the natural landscapes that were once part of California's Central Coast scenery with our museum library and archivist, Terry Sheridan. To all of you, thanks for being with us tonight and thank you so much for supporting the museum and Sea Center with your membership. We are very grateful. And please let your friends and neighbors know that we, uh, the museum and Sea Center outdoor spaces are open and come visit us soon. Until then, feel free to contact me if you'd like information about our Leadership Circles program or have any suggestions for future Legends of the Halls topics. And stay connected with the museum and Sea Center activities on our website at sbnature.org. Stay cool, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.